well, that was one of the better lunches I ever had. <laughs> Is he D-A-R-R-Y-L, or do you remember? Daryl? Delwyn. Delwyn, no wonder I couldn't find it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, I'll do better if I know how to spell it. <laughs> it works better. Uh, I uh, have put clipped right here. I, I, I never used notes, so I didn't know what to do with them. Uh, but there's a list up here of stuff I have to get through that, that came up during the break. And so I jotted quickly while we were eating lunch uh, some things that I, I need to do a, a little bit of house cleaning about. Before I do that, I don't want to leave this and turn this paper over um, without saying one last thing. In um, December of last year, for the first time, all of the hyphenateds, or at least representatives of most of the hyphenated groups in this country, came together. Um, there was a conference called the Great Emergence Conference on Friday and Saturday uh, at the cathedral in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, in the Diocese of West Tennessee. And on Thursday, the hyphenateds um, all came together. Um, and, and one of the distinctions, I think, that needs to be made uh, between uh, a Presbyterian approach to this thing and the rest of us is that the moderator of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church in America, uh, which is as high as it gets, it's their PB, uh, actually came and was himself present in order to be in, in, in conversation uh, with his, pres with his Presb emergence, which speaks to, and, and in, in the defense of the Episcopalians, uh, Bishop Catherine could not come, but she did send three people from 815, Brackett and Martin and, and Clyde Gates, uh, Craig Gates, so that, um, you know, Clay Gates, I'll say it right in a minute, they, uh, they were there too, as was true of some of the other denominations. But uh, I think that that speaks uh, to two things. The level and involvement increasingly on the part of Jerusalem with Antioch uh, across denominational lines, and also the fact that for the first time, we all came together as hyphenateds for the morning session. Then an afternoon uh, broke into our particular uh, cliques, or whatever you want to call them, uh, our hyphens, uh, and then came again uh, for a closing session together um, to begin to see. And one of the characteristics of one of these uh, tsunamis or upheavals or whatever, and I know I've said it and I'll say it again, one of the characteristics of going through these things is that whatever held hegemony, uh, last time around it was Roman Catholicism, this time around it's Protestantism, whatever held hegemony, when we pass through this rummage sale or this tsunami or this major shift, when we go through one, when we go through one of the greats, one of the characteristics of it is that whatever held pride of, pr of place stops and regroups. It just does. It has to drop back, it loses hegemony, and then it reconfigures what it's doing. And one of the fascinating things to me about Memphis was to see, even uh, among the hyphenated, some sense of, of, of kind of regrouping uh, and rediscovering each other. The meth emergence came down the hall to the Anglo emergence and said, they sent a man down the hall and he said, we think we may all belong in the same room. And I went to the door and said, you think? Uh, <laughs> and uh, we, we are seeing, of course, uh, every evidence of reconfiguration on the part of Protestantism. Ann and I were talking during the break. There, there are some observers, do what I do, who um, say that the National Council of Churches is in many ways a first step toward reconfiguring. There is no question that call to common mission uh, is, is a, re, uh, a regrouping, if you will. Uh, and not only, of course, is it us and the Lutherans, but the Methodists now are making a, a, an attempt, and it will happen sometime in the next year, I mean, uh, where we will have common recognition of common ordination, ability to swap back and forth with clergy, uh, so forth and so on. So there is reconfiguration happening, uh, and that is, has to be expected. So far as I know, and I believe it to be correct, um, uh, anyway, I've been told that the most uh, obvious example of reconfiguration is in Wales itself, um, a very small country, obviously, where the five uh, Protestant churches, five big uh, recognized by the state, uh, Presbyterian and the official, uh, yada, 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 Methodist, uh, now share one physical headquarters. Um, that is, they, they, they operate five denominations out of one building and one secretarial staff. Uh, which is just amazing that the scotch tape doesn't get in the way of the, I don't know, whatever, <laughs> that, that it happens. Uh, so we will be seeing m more and more of that. Now, having said that, I have this list up here of things that got brought up during the 
during the break. And yes, we're going to have time. I am going to shut up, and we're going to have time to talk to each other and to have Q&A. However, these things I thought were pertinent enough, so they need to be mentioned before we go on. Uh, uh, the first of these is that Anne corrected me, and it, it absolutely, why I keep making the mistake, I don't know. Of course, Brian McLaurin wasn't the only non-Episcopalian to speak at Lambeth. Jonathan Sachs, Rabbi of London, uh, you know, of the British Isles, uh, was also an invited speaker. So the good rabbi, Jonathan Sachs, and Brian McLaurin uh, were both there. And as Anne said when we were chatting, and of course that speaks to the same thing. Uh, that speaks to the Judeo-Christian thing uh, that is a big part of, of the emergent sensibility. So let me stand corrected on that. That's number one. Uh, uh, number, uh, number two is um, that, I can't read my own right, okay. One of you reminded me that in skipping over 44 things that happened in the last century or in the peri-emergence um, that, that really mattered, I probably skipped one I should never have skipped, and I am persuaded uh, you're absolutely right. So I'm going to go pick that one up because I think it does matter. Uh, so if you will go back with me to the mid-20th century in your minds, uh, some of you will remember, others of you may have heard jokes about it anyway, uh, some of you will remember that we were just in uh, to television. Uh, and you know, radio had been wonderful, and I loved radio when I was a child. And I can remember as um, in ninth grade civics class, having to go over to a friend's uh, house, the whole class, because uh, his father had a television. And none of us knew what it was, and it took up half the room, for goodness sakes. It was huge, but it was there. And we were there as the civics class so we could watch General MacArthur, honest to goodness, fade away, uh, just on a very cloudy screen. But we sat there and watched the old boy leave uh, through the snow. And it was so impressive uh, that you could get a picture. It wasn't long after that, if you will remember, that the first churchman to really understand the implications of what that medium was about. And a lot, the point was well made this morning, this afternoon. A lot of what the emergence is about is not just the internet, it's about the ability to merge entertainment and information. And that's, you know, it, it really, it's, it's built on that. So it wasn't long before a fellow named Fulton Sheen, remember here Bishop Sheen? Honey, there was never a bishop in all of God's kingdom like Fulton Sheen when he came on screen. I used to sit there as a kid and just love it. You talk about purple, it never had it so good, you know? Uh, <laughs> and he was the rings, the whole thing. All he lacked was angels serving as acolytes. Uh, and, and he got up there and he entertained America for God one night a week, every week. And he was wonderful. You didn't have to be Roman Catholic, you didn't have to be Christian uh, to, to really love that guy. He was the first to understand what it could do. After that, you get a progression, and you really do, that's absolutely true. You get a progression, of, I mean, you get Benny Hinn. Now, there's the opposite of Fulton Sheen. If you've ever watched Benny Hinn catching them as they fall back and go to glory, uh, you know, or cure them or whatever. Anyway, you get Benny Hinn, uh, you, you get uh, Jim Baker, Jim and Tammy Faye, may she rest in peace, bless her heart. She died a terrible death about a year and a half ago, and I, did. I was fond of her. Um, we were friends in an odd kind of, across the great abyss. Um, uh, of differences, but uh, she was a wonderful human being. And uh, so anyway, you get all of the televangelists. Now they did more harm to American religion, probably, but not to its Christianization, okay? And there's a distinction. We are post-literate, we are post-modern, we are post-rational, we are post-denominational, we are post-Protestant, we are post-Christendom which is to say that now we are beginning, Judaism has always understood that there's a difference between being an orthodox or observant Jew and being an ethnic Jew. We have never made that distinction in Christianity. We are beginning to make it. That is to say, there is a difference between being a practicing Christian and living within a culture or an ethos that is Christianized. And much of televangelism dealt with uh, the Pat Robertsons of this world, or the, you know, they dealt with, or Jerry Falwells, they dealt with the Christianization and not necessarily with the devout Christian. They belong in many ways. Uh, well, uh, let me stop and, and just tell you t about the difference. Alan, uh, Alan Wolf is a very respected uh, demographer at NYU, and I'm going to 
get some of the details a little wrong. The, the theory will be right because I, I haven't looked it up, but didn't know I was going to do it until we got to this over the break. Alan Wolf, about three years ago, uh, and, and I think it was three, three or four anyway, um, joined with the New York Times to do a massive survey of where people in America were coming from in terms of religion. And they randomly selected, I think a thousand was the sample of it. Anyway, and he found the predictable things. He found, uh, if I remember his figures, 93% of us believe in God of some form or another. We, we have some sort of religious affiliation. Uh, and the other 7% of us uh, are either atheist or we don't want to play the game and decline to answer. Um, of that 93, 83% or 84, and I'm not sure, uh, claimed Christianity. Back buried in this huge instrument, trying to find where everybody was, uh, back in this huge instrument was a question, do you believe in the historicity of the virgin birth? Now that looked like just a no-brainer. I mean, it was just there and it was one of the things you checked off. Well, okay, you've got 83 or 84% of us who are, um, you know, Christian, professing Christians, and you've got 82% of us who believe in the virgin birth. Uh-uh, ain't no way. There ain't no way that's going to be true. You don't have, you know, it's just not. And he looked at it and said, can't be true, and thought he had made a mistake, and went back and resurveyed. I mean, it's an expensive kind of thing, uh, but he's an excellent scholar. Went back and resurveyed, and the reason it was that high was not that Christians believed in the virgin birth, but over half of the atheists in the country also believe in the virgin birth because you can't have Christmas without her. You know, I mean, and, and I love it. I just thought, that's what we mean by being Christianized, okay? And, and so what, what we have to deal with uh, is the fact that we, you know, we've, we've got a kind of Christianized thing going on here. Uh, and, and we're not that anymore. We're, we're post-Christian. So uh, it, the point can be made that much of television or perhaps the use of it was dedicated toward Christianization uh, of the country. Part of it was not even deliberately uh, that way. Uh, specifically, and this is the one that came up at lunch that I jumped and shouldn't have. Um, in, there was a man, uh, well, there was a man named Freud who had a uh, pupil named Jung who had a pupil named uh, Joseph Campbell, whom you may have heard of. Joseph Campbell uh, actually taught at Sarah Lawrence, and um, his area of expertise was, of course, comparative religion which originally started out as a kind of comparative mythology and grew into a comparative religion fascination. Um, near the end of his life, after he left Sarah Lawrence, thinking, uh, honestly thinking, that he needed a larger podium uh, than his classroom at Sarah Lawrence, and, and he did. Uh, he hooked up um, with Bill Moyers, who is the ultimate communicator, ultimate communicator. Uh, and in 1989, they released, uh, at that point, uh, Campbell had died. He did not live to see the release of The Power of Myth. Uh, but PBS released, uh, and it, uh, posthumously, The Power of Myth, which was Joseph Campbell talking about the confluences and the similarities, or whatever you want to call it, amongst all religions. Uh, and because it's Moyers, and because he is a genius at communication, uh, it is still the best-selling film PBS has in its stack. It is still the one that sells the most, is the power of myth. Why did it matter? It mattered because Moyers, I think, was the first to really understand. Maybe Fulton Sheen did, but Moyers certainly was close to the front, first to understand that when you say things to people who are sitting in their own living room, in their own jeans or dungies or, or whatever, with their feet up in their lounge chair at the end of the day, probably with a little refreshment in their hand, meaning beer or something like that, and you tell them these things and they're watching it up there and all of the guards are down. All of the vetting system is parked somewhere else. There is nothing up here saying, watch it, watch it, watch it. Do I believe it? Do I believe it? It's just, I'm, you know, watching kind of thing and let me go in. You know, that's my husband, not me. I sit in a different way. <laughs> I don't have nits, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> you know, and you let it in. And the line between entertainment and information gets totally lost. Now, if you were sitting in one of these blessed pews, 
listening to somebody up in the pulpit that's there and more like a if you if some of the things that were said in the power of myth in, in 1989 had been said in that context and you were in your best bib and tucker and you were on a hard bench all of your you know all of your guards would be up and you would say no half of you might even walk out of the room as devout christians saying not going to believe that not going to tolerate that going to not going to listen to that it's the difference in the delivery place, if you will, or if the venue is a better word, the venue in which it comes. And if from lawyers on, from Joseph Campbell on, well, two things happen. The first is, it's the first time we begin to seriously engage as a country the fact that all religions share an awful lot. And it's a very clear fact that all religions share a common wisdom. It is in their mysteries that they differ. And we're just now beginning to realize that that's a pivotal thing I just said right there. In their wisdoms, they are almost all identical. Even in their iconography and in some of their symbolisms, they are almost all alike. It is in their mysteries that the religions begin to differ. And of course, what Campbell was dealing with was their wisdoms and some of their symbols and, and a, a symbolization of what's going on. And so they do look enormously alike. But from then on, the conversation about the distinction, the beginning of, when I finally get around to changing this page right here, the beginning of this question of the theology of religion comes in this country with Moyer, and by and large comes in the world with Moyer, because he jumped our national boundaries and went all over the UK and the English-speaking world. It was that powerful a thing. Now, one has to say logically, I think, that if the Times had not been ready, uh, it wouldn't have happened. Uh, uh, there's more than technology here. Obviously, we were globalizing already, and we were beginning to find out not everybody was Christian. Isn't that odd, you know? Uh, and, and what in the world were they doing being Hindus or Sikhs or whatever? Um, so there, we were gaining some familiarity. So it happened. But the, the first thing you have to say about this uh, is that it introduced the question. Um, and, and, and the second thing you have to say about it is it began to reveal to us the power of that information entertainment diffusion. The best piece, and I'm dead serious, going out on a limb, and I, every time I do it, and I've done it many times, the limb still holds. The best piece of popular theology that was done in the last half of the last century was The Matrix. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. The best piece of popularly accessible, and it too works. You don't think you're being informed or educated. You think you're being entertained, but baby, you know, whether it's Gnosticism revisited and thanks to the Wachowski brothers or not, I don't know. But I do know that's a theological piece. At a much less sophisticated level, touched by an angel conveyed a whole lot of theology in an entertainment way. And if you don't remember touched by an angel, you ought to go look at it again. And you ought to be aware that Della Reese, the star, and her producer are both ordained clergy who said right from the get-go, we cannot do enough in a pulpit. We decided to fictionalize it and go on popular television. And it's a deliberate attempt to teach theology in that kind of relaxed level. So what's the takeaway for church? The takeaway for church immediately, the immediate response, was to begin to have small groups talking about films and talking about books and, and talking about uh, TV and, and that kind of thing. That's great. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. The next response was to have the church try to be an entertainer. There's a whole lot wrong with that, uh, probably. You know, It's not good. But the recognition has to come that indeed that line is there, and it has to be dealt with. That line of diffusion between where it's information uh, and, and where it's entertainment. Um, and uh, the use now, by emergence primarily, of Bible stories to try to, con to try to bring the theology back into the narrative form. Much of the push toward narrative theology in emergence Christians is a recognition that we've been here and seen this and we know how it looks and that's what we're doing. So that, that one was uh, one of the ones I skipped and just plain went on over it. Uh, and uh, in, in terms of uh, the reconfiguring idea that I was talking about a minute ago, uh, let me also add that next month, uh, for the first time so far as I know, uh, there, there is going to be uh, a gathering in New Mexico, in Albuquerque, 
uh, convened by Father Richard Rohr, whom many of you, I assume, may know, a uh, big Roman Catholic in contemplative study. Uh, and it's going to be an attempt to bring the Roman Catholic uh, communion and Cath emergence uh, in conjunction with emergence Christianity uh, and uh, close that line that was open 500 years ago. I'm very excited about it. I, I think it's wonderful that indeed we are reconfiguring not only as Protestants, but we are reconfiguring across that old um, traditional abyss, uh, if you will, uh, between the two of them. So I, I call that uh, to your attention. Now, uh, the next question was, um, and I should have said this to start with, uh, how come, it, it was put nicely, I can't remember how it was put, so uh, I, I think you actually put it, uh, how did you put all this together or something like that? Uh, and uh, it was gently put. What it really sort of sounds like, and, and she didn't mean it this way, was, Whose authority did you do this on? You know? are, are you self-appointed? Uh, and and uh, the, the answer is very simple. Uh, I was uh, in publishing, I was an academic for a while and then went into publishing, um, and for 35 years was head of, of three different southern publishing houses. And in the course of those years, uh, became very familiar with the staff of Publishers Weekly, uh, which is the trade journal for the book industry and had fully retired from all of the above and was going to turn at last into a writer. I may yet live long enough to become a writer. I don't know, I keep producing books, but I'm not sure I'm a writer yet, whatever. Uh, anyway, I was happily plugging along in uh, 89, 90, uh, retired to be a writer, and suddenly religion took off uh, in the book market. Uh, those of you who remember those years will remember that everything was religion. All of the bestseller books were, were religion. Uh, there were saints everywhere. Uh, you know, you, you saw uh, Saint, uh, Saint, Celtic was everywhere. If it were printed in green, you could sell it whether it said anything or not. It was, it was just amazing. And so you had all of a sudden, all of these secular houses in America, which had never been in religion, religion had prior to that been published by denominational houses primarily. So by and large, there was no publishing in a secular level of religious material. But all of a sudden, it's what's selling. And so you get these huge growths. In 92, it was the growth of 92.3% at Baker and Taylor, which is the distributor of all the books to America's libraries. 92.3% jump in one fiscal year of the movement of religion product to the nation's libraries. That's, those of you with any business experience are aware that's pathologic. Two years later, Ingram Book Company, which is the distributor of books to everybody, all the stores, Amazon even, and Barnes and Noble and .com, all books move, uh, Sam's Warehouse, all books move through Ingram. And in 94, in they had a, a growth of 245% in the movement, in one fiscal year, in the movement of religion product to the nation's bookstores. That's huge. No industry, much as it may enjoy it, can afford that. You just simply can't do that. And so the pressure was on the trade magazine to come do something about it. Cover religion, get it out there, let us find out what we're doing. Uh, and, and I got a call saying, will you, there's never been a religion department at Publishers Weekly, but will you come out of retirement and set up the department? And my immediate response to who, the woman who became my employer and who had been a friend up to then is, why me? And her answer was, because you know publishing, and whoever does this is going to have to know publishing, and I'm pretty sure you know God, which I thought was, <laughs> okay, all right. Good friend, she should. Uh, and so I picked my little self up and betook myself uh, to West 7th Street in New York, and we set up a department. That lasted about 18 months. It's, uh, it's not that a department runs itself, but within 18 months, if you can't get one up and running, it ain't gonna run. Uh, but, and it became immediately uh, apparent after we got the dust to settle down a little bit that what was needed was what publishers were wanting and booksellers were wanting was tell us what the hee-haw is going on. Why did we suddenly get this huge tick up in interest in religion? Where's it coming from? What does it look like? Why is it there? And of course, principally, what should we be acquiring in order to publish next? Uh, which was where the rubber really hit the road. Yes, because they, I mean, they're in the business of making money. And, and increasingly, as I talked to publishers, I began to realize that the research was all there. 
it was, it was hanging here in this place, or it was in this department of the sociology of religion, or it was over here. The scholarship was there. You can go all the way back to 1907 to Walter Rauschenbusch's uh, Christianity and the coming social crisis of the 21st century. And the first 40 or 45 pages of that book, it was reissued uh, uh, three years ago because it was so important that it had a 100th anniversary issue, reissue. The first 40, 45 pages of that book are the Reformation, or we are in reformation, or we are going through reformation again, or it's coming and I can feel it. That's what the 21st century is going to be about. Um, you can look at Tillich's letters, and in, uh, he doesn't say it in his formal writings, but in his letters he'll say something like, the ground is beginning to shift again, or I can feel the ground shifting, or here comes the medievalism uh, kind of thing, indicating he knew exactly what was happening. And you can find Ponenberg in the 60s. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, you know, uh, Tillich was right. Every time we go through one of these things, we jump back 500, one of the first things we do is jump back 500 years to where we assume things were really lovely. Now, if you were born in 1400, you would not have thought it was lovely at all. And by any, I mean, they didn't even have water closets, for heaven's sake. Uh, how bad is that? You know, it wasn't like, but, but the jump back is a kind of an attempt to romanticize what it was like before the 500 years that are annoying you were like. And so Tillich was right. We were passing through and are just now coming out of a period of neo-medievalism in which everything that was medieval was hugely attractive because those were the good days before the Protestants screwed it up. Now, if you believe that, you're crazy. But if you didn't watch Star Trek and didn't watch uh, The Matrix, uh, don't look at people wearing goth clothing. If you don't understand what body tattooing is about, if you don't understand why it is that Joan of Arcadia, there's a really modern name, uh, became a popular TV. If you don't know why um, the Da Vinci Code works, well, let me tell you, that's neo-medievalism. That's exactly what it is. It's a romanticized edition, and Tillich was absolutely right. So the scholarship was there. But like much scholarship, while it is resident in the various academic departments where it is, there's no need to synthesize it until there's a commercial or money-bearing need. And once you get a commercial need to do it, then you get somebody. And at the time I started, there were probably three of us in this country doing it. Now there are, I don't know, 20, 30 of us uh, uh, working for commercial outlets still, uh, trying to uh, analyze the religious landscape uh, and to talk about it. And there's an honesty to the cash register. People will lie all over the place to demographers and census takers about their sex life and their God life. I don't know what the connection is, but they will. They want both of them to be more than they are, uh, and they will be pleased to say so. You know, but the, the cash register absolutely tells you the truth. They will not pay money for that which doesn't interest them. They're not going to do it. So when the cash register begins to talk religion, we're talking serious God talk. And of course, what happened was that the peri emergence began to arise at Hard Old Boyle. Uh, but, and so you get the commercial response to it, and that's exactly what was happening. That's where the information comes from. Uh, why am I doing what I do now? Because I retired from the magazine three times uh, and didn't get away from it, uh, and finally uh, went in and said, uh, all right, I resign. Uh, and my boss, my, my dear friend, said, why? This is an, I'm tired of taking your retirement, and I'm not happy about your resignation. And I said, I thought maybe it was a rhetorical problem, so I changed the wording. And she said, no, I, I'm going to accept it. I will accept it now if you'll just tell me why. And I said to her in a moment of um, honesty that I hadn't anticipated saying, because I've been talking to publishers and booksellers, and I know now that there's something I need to go and say to my church uh, and to my communion. And she said, why the hell didn't you say that three times back? And I'd have let <laughs> devout you, devout you. Uh, uh, and, and so that's where it came from. Uh, and, and I should have made that clear. Uh, so that this information, if you go to uh, any large net, te television network, you'll find somebody doing what I'm doing. Uh, most newspapers uh, used to have somebody doing what I'm doing. Uh, essentially, now they are on lower budgets and, and they're not there. So it's a kind of sociology of religion as it's commercially applied, uh, if you will, if, if you were going to give it a, a name. Uh, I think that's the end of the things I had to. Uh, yes. Uh, all right. Now, 
we can, we can turn this uh, over in just a minute. Okay, now I'm on to new material. Um, we are going to talk in a few minutes amongst ourselves about where the rubber hits the road here, about what it means at the parish level, or at, even at the diocesan level, or the congregational level. Many of you, I discovered over break, are not really Anglicans. You're closet Anglicans. You're, you're lookalikes. Uh, you belong to other communions, and I'm delighted. So we'll speak congregationally as well as, as in terms of parishes. Um, but I am going to speak in terms of uh, the, the um, Church of England. Uh, I said earlier that uh, Britain and uh, Europe in general uh, secularized some 25 or 30 years before we did. Uh, by secularization, that is to say that they began to separate. Christendom began to end. They began to separate the church from the state and their function as citizens of the kingdom of God and citizens of the state began to become two distinct things. That's secularization. One of the most fascinating sets of figures I've seen in a long time came into my office back in the fall, and I wish I had kept it. I can't imagine why I rarely throw things away, but it was Germany, uh, which for the first time, and you would know it would be the Germans, for the first time in, in a very long time, uh, took a census to see uh, how many people were actually uh, Christian. Uh, and they found that only 6% of Germany uh, in 06, of, of Germans, claimed to be Christian. Um, which was interesting until they went back and discovered that what that meant was only 6% still went to the state church, still absolutely went to church, to the state church, but that Christianity per se was bigger than it has ever been in Germany. Those are emergence Christians. Those are ones who are not going to the state church, who are not going to the Lutheran church, uh, but who are functioning out of cell churches and out of cohorts and that kind of thing. So that Christianity is growing while even as we speak, uh, the state church is, is going down. Now, in uh, England and in those uh, countries co colonized and established by England, a number of things have been going on because they've been at it a little longer. First of all, they do not speak of emergence Christianity in terms of the emergent church. They speak in terms of fresh expressions churches. That is to say, they're emerging and emergent congregations. Those dealing with emergence Christianity are regarded as fresh expressions. They're a term for it. When uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, read Brian, some four years ago now, read Brian, five years, read Brian McLaurin's A Generous Orthodoxy, he said, I've heard him say it, he said, I wanted to buy up every single copy of that book that was in print hire an airplane and airlift them over every part of the United Kingdom. I want my people to see and hear what this thing is because it's where we're going. And he has gone right from that straight on. Some five years ago this May, he established the Office of Fresh Expressions at Lambeth. It is a division uh, now of, of his oversight. Um, and it was in, established simply to put one official position over what is happening as these congregations begin to emerge up out of the Church of England. Um, that was held for five years by Stephen Croft. Um, Father Croft will be leaving that position in May uh, because he's being elevated to the episcopacy, um, an indication that the archbishop wants him to have that kind of, having the information of five years of doing it, to have that kind of authority. The job will be taken over by Bishop Graham Cray, who is Bishop of Maidstone, uh, and who will be coming as a sitting bishop uh, into that office and will be running the Office of Fresh Expressions in conjunction with uh, an appointee from the United Methodist Church because the two communions in England are indeed deciding to be in the same room uh, and, and, and to work together. Uh, bishop Cray, uh, before he took this office, uh, some four, four years ago now, uh, was on the Archbishop's Council uh, and was already expressing interest in fresh expressions in emergence Christianity. And he was the head of a committee that put together a book called The Mission-Shaped Church. The Mission-Shaped Church is one, I honestly, th it's not on your list for, I don't think it is, I think we decided not to put it, because you can download it uh, if you want to. All you have to do is go get The Mission-Shaped Church, and it's there. It's 187 pages, and it might be cheaper to buy the book. I've never made up my mind, but if you pay the postage on it, it's a real pain in the neck, so it's cheaper to pay a, for a cartridge and, and print up the, the thing. The Mission-Shaped Church was the first a formal attempt by the uh, Church of England to begin to deal with emergence Christianity in an in a overall a kind of global sort of way. 
And two or three of the things it says are very pertinent to the conversation we're going to have in a little while. I hope if I shut up and we get to it. Uh, first of all, uh, it, it, is, it, makes, it, it makes the distinction, it says, it's called mission shape, simply because the thesis is that as we become more and more secular, as like Germany, more and more of us don't go to church, but do begin to practice Christianity outside of the structures of existing church. As that happens, we not only have to be concerned about those who are like that, but we have to be concerned about our fellow citizens who aren't churched at all, or who have never been churched, or who have been churched and really didn't like it and have walked away. That is to say, Home missions is no longer to be conceived of as going into Appalachia and sitting on a stool on a dirt-covered floor to try to save the souls of people who've been Christian for 200 years, they just haven't been in church. Home missions is who's sitting next to you at Starbucks. Home missions is who's next to you on the train every morning as you go into the city. Home missions is who's next door at the condo. Home missions is here, now, in your face, and you better pay attention to it. And the mission field now, and to use the terminology of the UK church, the, the terminology is the mission field is the de-churched, the unchurched, and the non-churched. And that is to say, the de-churched are those who were reared in some form of Christianity and absolutely hated it. They were so damaged by that process that they're not getting near a church ever. And the world, well, there are a lot of those folk out here. We all know them. They didn't understand why they couldn't play cards on Sunday. It was stupid. And if my soul depends on that, I don't care. Uh, they are persuaded that every, all of those rules are dumb. They don't make any sense. All the things that ruined my life came out of that kind of fundamental religion. They don't believe in sola scriptura with a viciousness. They don't believe in it, you know. Couldn't possibly be seen. They will not darken your door. They are not going to. They will instantly darken your website. Because of the anonymity of the web, yeah, they are in second life worshiping, or they are on blogs, or they are lighting candles at, at uh, gratefulness.org. They are out there. They can, they can vent their fury and express their longing for home in the net. And a net ministry is where you begin to pull these people in. Am I saying that every parish here or every congregation needs a net ministry? No. I mean, I think that's up to you. It's not easy to do. It doesn't run itself. I'm just saying, and, and, and England is right. UK is right. These people are caught in, in the, that's how you garner these fish into the kingdom, is through the net because of its anonymity. The non-church are those people who grew up after mama went to work. <laughs> they, they are those people who grew up when we lost biblical literacy. Those are the, the people when we started working, the average one of us, 50 hours a week and Sunday morning, we just honestly didn't have the strength to get up and go, and we quit going. Uh, and, and so they, they just... They don't have, they have some sort of faint memory that great granddaddy was a Baptist preacher out in the woods somewhere, and that's about it. So they, they are a tabula rasa. They can be written on immediately. Can you attract them? Yes, you can attract them. The non-churched are the easiest to get at because they're innocent and because somewhere there is this faint longing, this faint longing for some of the ritual of life, for some of the some of the things that give it aesthetic beauty, for some of the things you can feel, they're there and they're right for the picking. The unchurched are those who went to church and then they changed jobs or they moved over the weekend and Sunday morning came and they didn't go and they didn't know where the nearest church was in this new apartment they were in and next Sunday they were still unpacking and the Sunday after that they still hadn't looked up the nearest church and the Sunday after that and they just never went back. They're just there. They're not against church. They're not ignorant of church. They're just not part of church. Uh, they, too, are a fairly fertile field. Each of those groups has to be addressed differently. And also, and I think UK is right about this, you have to decide which group you're going for because you do it by different means. And you decide that on the basis of what your parish or your church looks like in terms of where it is and what's around it. The next thing that they found is, uh, and, and it's absolutely true, 
The next thing they found is that whatever emergence Christianity is, it's communal. It is very, very communal. It is community oriented. It is generally found more in the Rust Belt areas, but it's communal. And wherever the community is, is where the worship is going to spring up. And that's fine. Except if you, own this if you own this architecture right here, you cannot assume you can build community in that architecture. You're going to have to go where the community is to build the church. Now, you may be able to, in some way, use this building, uh, perhaps, by letting communities that you have planted or that you have encouraged come in from time to time and use it. But you cannot assume that you or any magician going is going to be able to make the communities come in. It isn't going to happen. These communities are really happy with each other. And so what the Mission Shaped Church says is, you take the church out to the daycare center. People are in the daycare center and, and right, go right next door to a little building or to the nearest piece of strip mall nearest to the daycare center, uh, where, which is empty, uh, that you can rent for a little bit. And you put a service in there. It would be really lovely if the service were about 7 o'clock in the morning when mama or daddy are delivering the kids, or 5.30 or 6 in the afternoon when they're picking them up, and if it's child friendly. But you've got a natural community there. Or you go over to the nearest bowling alley. You've got a community there. You take some space, maybe an empty office in the bowling alley. I can tell from your faces this is not ringing your chimes. This does not sound like your local knave. Uh, it's not. But, but the point is, well, and it's, it's why Fresh Expressions has worked very well in the UK, is the recognition that there are natural communities. And we don't even mind driving to our community. It's not that we don't want to drive to the church. We drive to work and recognize it as a community. We drive to the bowling alley. We drive to the pub. So that, that's not the problem. It's that there are natural reasons for community there. And the assumption that worship is a natural reason for community is just not good enough anymore unless, unless you are a re-traditionalist. If you're a re-traditionalist, it is. But if you're an emergence, I could do as much just talking to my fellow Christians and emergent Christians, and we can have just as much. Can't do the sacraments, but I can do everything else. In addition, the UK found that sometimes, uh, well, the first thing is you can't, the Archbishop called it mixed economy, and that's, that's his term. He even says that he's the one who invented it. Rowan Williams, mixed economy churches, which is to say one parish church, one uh, congregation, one, one uh, congregational church sitting here can sometimes do two things. It can sometimes be the traditional thing, and it can also have a branch over here that is emergence Christian or that is alternative worship. If you do that, you have to be very careful. You're not going to do it in the same sacred space, but you can generally do the alt-worship, or if you want, or the emergence Christianity, either slightly off-site or down in the basement or somewhere like that. It can be done. Only if your vestry or your board of session or whatever all understand what's going on. But the last thing you can afford is for some you know, loose canon, who's usually the senior warden, sometimes the junior warden, um, or the head of session, wandering through and seeing what's going on down there one night and blowing his or her stack because it won't work. There's got to be a clear understanding on the part of all of the people involved in the leadership of the established congregation that we're trying this thing, and this is why we're trying it. Uh, and this is what we're trying to do. And it won't look like your daddy's Pontiac or Oldsmobile. It isn't going to drive that way. It's a different thing. Mixed economy is real difficult, but it can be done, especially if it's all worship that's being done. One of the best examples of a mixed economy church I've seen in Episcopalianism is St. Mark's in San Antonio, where they run an absolute knockout, pure emergence, 11 o'clock service, up in one of the buildings attached uh, to the campus there, while at the same time there's a traditional service going on down in the nave. And they are light and dark away from each other. There are kids running all over the emergence thing. You know, they're painting, they're doing whatever, they're dancing, they're singing, they got the drop down screen. We're going to glory. Every once in a while we even read something that looks like it came out of the Book of Common Prayer. Uh, and it's amazing, uh, you know. Uh, but but it's, it's an emergence church. It's a mixed economy parish. But they're really hard to do, but they can. 
be, they can be done. In order to do a church plant, which is taking the church to the nearest natural community, taking it to a building next to um, the, the child care center or next to the office or next to the nearest start, that kind of thing usually has to be very consciously done by your vestry or your session or your board of elders or whatever. That is to say, you're going to have to bribe some people who look like they might be just a little bit emergent to go do it. And it's going to be a lonely thing. It's going to be like Evensong. It's going to be a lonely thing uh, for the first three or four or five weeks. But ultimately, it probably can be done as long as we're all of one mind that that's what we want to do and that we understand we're planting church and we're planting church in configuration with the great emergence as a secular thing and emergence Christianity as a clearly now definable, even if you can't quite describe, or describable if you can't define it, uh, form of Christianity. It's there and it can be done. Then one of the other things that especially is applicable to Episcopal and Anglican uh, polity and way of doing things is that the Church of England found that very often because the physical churches aren't anywhere near some of the communities. It is easier to church plant several parishes together or several congregations together in which instead of asking your vestry or board of elders or session to fund one of these plants to see what would happen solely out of their pocket, it is better to get together St. Swiggum's in the Swamp and, and St. Matthew's and whatever and, and arrive at a place that's sort of central to a community but not any of your particular places and to share the cost. Uh, and they call that a kind of webbing of it uh, or a webbing church or a networking church. That also will work. But it, again, it takes leadership uh, who are willing to gamble that in several fairly, uh, fairly near to each other uh, congregations or parishes, so that there is a great deal to be learned from the mission-shaped church. You will also find there a real description of the difference between alt-worship, networked uh, churches, uh, uh, emergence churches, uh, hyphenated churches, and what they look like, along with um, some wonderful uh, examples of particular congregations and how they worship. What does it look like to go to an icon service, for instance? What is Ian Mobsby doing? Uh, what is Johnny Baker doing? What are, and several of you in your your cards mentioned Eon uh, Mobsby, uh, who is uh, an ordained priest, very, very clearly pulling this trick off. All right, one, uh, oh, geez, it's two o'clock. Uh, uh, one, uh, one quickie, and um, it's not a quickie. Why am I, uh, you know, anybody who promises you a quickie is a liar. But um, the, the authority question uh, still has not been answered, uh, and we have to get to it. And I guess the thing I want to say is, don't leave here thinking that scripture is dead because sola scriptura is dead. Uh, it's, a it's a major point here is that scripture always has been at the, every time we've gone through one of these things and asked where now is the authority, it has come back to scripture. But every, to one, one way or another. But every time we have done it and come back to it, we have either redesigned the canon or we have reconsidered whether we liked the canon the way it was or not, and we have repositioned how we access it in terms of language or attitude or maybe just voice. That's an, an important thing, and we're doing it right now. Remember that Martin Luther, when he got ready, you can, you can go back to Jerome, who's the, in 390, when St. Jerome goes to Jerusalem to begin the translation out of the Hebrew and out of the Greek into the Vulgate. It's the beginning, it's part of the tick up to the great decline and fall. He's beginning to mess with the scripture. When in that same period, Tayson's Diatessaron, which was a melding of the four Gospels and was the pulpit Bible for much of Christianity, Justin Martyr in a hundred of the common era is still saying not about, he's not talking about the Gospels, he talks about the memoirs of the four apostles. There's a huge difference in intimacy, if nothing else, between the memoirs of the four apostles and the Gospels, you know? And, 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 tes, uh, and the diatessaron is the merging into one common source because they didn't recognize the distinction to be made. They were innocent of the fact that Matthew is going to do it one way because he's a Jew and Luke's going to tell the same tale a different way because he's a Gentile. 
and they were really innocent of the fact that priest and pastor after priest and pastor can make unholy numbers of homilies about the difference between Luke and Matthew and never get around to what Jesus said, uh, you know, which is just really unfortunate. So you, you see the diatessaron going. Uh, so you see the reconfiguration. By the time you get to the Reformation, you get poor old Luther who's got it all figured out if he could just get rid of St. James and his dadgum epistle. You know, and so he moves to get the epistles stuck over in what he's going to call the Apocrypha. He also has taken a couple of, of hunks out of Peter, and he's taken Jude over there, and a few other things that get in the way of his understanding of how works works, uh, and how grace works. Uh, and, and uh, you know, so, and, and we call them uh, the antilegomena. Uh, that is, they, they were, um, to use Asubius' word, uh, those were the less than. And Luther, even though he didn't get away with lifting those out of the order we presently have them and putting them somewhere else, still regarded them as less than, which introduces the question of, is all scripture equal? Is every part of scripture equal? Uh, is it equal in authority? Is it equal in, 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 in every way? We've done that. And I would submit to you that in the year 1900, in this country, the head of the editor, Mr. Kleps, the, the editor of the Christian Herald, did what? For the first time, he got the notion that to really know who Jesus was, because we were already beginning to fixate on Jesus, we needed to print his words in red letters, in red ink, and it would pop out at us, you know? It's only been 109 years that we've done that thing that we assumed the angels did. No, it, 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 was, the, it was the peri-emergence way to begin to shuffle it. And then when you shuffle it a little farther, you get to J.B., well, you get to Schofield next, you know. Uh, Schofield, who, who really is the predecessor of, of Jerry Jenkins and, and Tim LaHaye, I think they met somewhere in heaven before they came here. Uh, but, uh, and you get Schofield, and what are you trying to do? You're trying to reference the narrative into one thing. That's exactly what you're trying to do. It wasn't dispensationalism so much as you're just trying to connect the whole thing into a whole. Uh, you get to J.B. Phillips in the middle of the last century in the Good News Bible. Some of you will remember what a joy that thing was. Oh my goodness, we can suddenly get at it. Then you get uh, the message, uh, Eugene Peterson's. I love that thing. And what is it? A translation? No. We invented a word for it. It's a paratranslation. It's a paratranslation is its official name. That is to say, it's the scripture, but it's fixed so you can get at it, you know. Um, and, and then you get the quest for the historical Jesus. Uh, and you, everything's up for grabs. And you get these idiots. No, you, you get these nice people. You get these credentialed academics uh, sitting out in, in, in Santa Rosa in a motel room voting whether Jesus said it or not by shooting ping pong balls in a bucket that's going by. And I am dead serious. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, uh, but it's modernist and it makes, and, and a lot of good people, I've got friends who, who were flying with ping pong balls. I sat there three times and watched them do it, as a matter of fact. Think, I can't believe I'm sitting here. Um, but, but it mattered because if we hadn't gone through that stage, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing now, which is the search for the canonical Jesus, uh, which is, is the second naivete. It's Niebuhr, Niebuhr's notion of second naivete. When you get as far as you can get with ping pong balls, you begin slowly to realize, you know, no, we don't know what he said. No, we're not sure this is exactly what he said. No, we're not sure that there weren't people who deliberately distorted as they copied, or who just distorted because in copying you distort. Um, we don't know that, and we're never going to know that. All we're going to know is that over the centuries, the beloved community has agreed in some way that either these were the words he left us, or these words are consonant with what we understand him to have been. And that is naive. That is so anti-intellectual. That is so illogical. It is so salvific. It is so marvelous, and it is so emergent, you know, to just say, this is it. Let's go find out who he is in the canon and begin to make him our authority. Uh, and so uh, scripture is not dead. It ain't ever going to be dead. Scripture just is being revisited, you know, which gets us to questions like, Hmm, which is more important? The words of Jesus in the first synopti in the synoptics and the and Acts, uh, the first chapter of Acts and the and the book of John. Is that co-equal and covalent with all those letters from Paul? Are we to assume that they had the same salvific force? And at what point did the church decide that uh, 
Paul had the same salvific force. Well, if you have to look at, look at history, uh, it took a while, you know. It was like 500 and something before we were totally sure that they were called Balaam. We knew they were scripture, but, you know, did scripture end? When did it end? When did God stop talking? When did the, when did the prophets stop being recorded? All those questions are on the table. But scripture, and they wouldn't be on the table if scripture weren't important. And so, uh, I, I'm go unless I'm going to go to questions in a minute, and, and we will maybe come back to these in question, I just want to do one last thing. Um, <clears throat> because of the authority thing. The authority thing is going to be very serious. Uh, and, and be aware also, for the first time in going through these things, the answer for the society is going to be different from the answer for the, the Christian community. We're going to get two answers for the first time. One of the things about being post-Christendom is that it does not necessarily follow that what we decide as Christians is the basis of authority. It's going to be the same thing that the state decides is the basis for authority. But having said that, we Anglicans and the Methodists among us also are, are familiar with the three-legged stool which I have affectionately referred to many times in my life as Hooker's damn stool, um, <laughs> which, uh, which held that uh, the reason Anglicanism is not a Protestant, uh, not part of Protestantism, is the three-legged stool. Uh, that is, uh, Hooker was uh, one of the, well, it goes farther back than that, forgive me, that was a, that was a real, uh, we're, not, uh, we're not Protestant because we have Celtic beginnings. We're not Protestant because uh, there was a, a thing called uh, St. Augustine being sent uh, by Gregory in, in uh, 6005, uh, 605 uh, to the UK to anglicize them, or to, uh, to Christianize them. Uh, we're, we're not uh, Protestant for a number of reasons. The Synod of Whitby be damned, but nonetheless, uh, we, we, we are what we are. And one of the reasons is the Via Media, um, the middle of the road, where <clears throat> Most accidents in all Episcopalians happen, uh, <coughs> you know, but, but we've got that play. We never believed in foundationalism for scripture, never was, and we, we got around it by saying, yes, scripture, and scripture only so long as we also understand with common sense or, or reason, if you will, uh, and based on the tradition of the church. Uh, there is a sort of second naivete built into our core right from the get-go. And so those were, those were his, uh, the, the three, legs of his stool, which doesn't even look like a stool anymore, but we're getting there. Uh, my suspicion, and it's just a suspicion, and so this is a tentative statement of where I think, if I'm reading the landscape, we're going to go, or close to where we're going to go, is that one of, one of the legs of the stool is going to be scripture. There's no question. What we call scripture how we define it, how we translate it, how we reevaluate all of its parts is up for grabs, but it'll be one of the legs of the stool. There ain't any question. The other one I'm dead sure of is the beloved community. And if we had had more time, I would have spent some time on the theory of the beloved community. It got so uh, connected with the civil rights movement and uh, Martin Luther King used it so that I really think part of the popularity of the phrase now is the association with King uh, because emergence is deeply involved in social justice and very, very uh, concerned with King. Uh, that was the reason that the Great Emergence Conference met in Memphis, as a matter of fact, in December, the first one when it was called and convened, was convened so everybody could see uh, the Martin Luther King Museum, so they could all all go see where he was actually slaughtered. And it was held in the cathedral, the Episcopal Cathedral uh, in Memphis, simply because when he was killed, the dean of that cathedral rushed into the sacristy, grabbed the processional cross, went out to Poplar Avenue, which is the main thoroughfare, into City Hall, and led uh, the clergy uh, of the whole city down in procession behind that cross straight to City Hall to demand mercy for the garbage strike uh, workers who were being persecuted and some sort of repentance for the awful thing uh, that had happened. And so that cross was very much a symbol and a part of what that meeting was about. So there's a strong, there's a strong part. And, and, and the beloved community, uh, as it's being, if I read correctly, defined by emergence Christianity means the church historic, the church global, the church traditional, the church immortal, the church triumphant. 
It's you and me at Starbucks. It's four of us having a beer at Who's It's Pub, whatever. Uh, it, it's all of those things, but it is also when we gather in the communion of saints in prayer, when we understand that as we approach Scripture, we approach it as a community, when we understand the whole thing of being church without being, when, when as Ron Williams puts it, somewhere along the way, church became a place to be instead of a way of being. And when we made that place to be, we lost a great deal. Church, if it's not a place to be, is the beloved community. It's a way to be. It's a beingness. And that's what they mean. Over here, over here is a, one that I got knocked upside the head the other day uh, by a, a dear friend. Um, it was kind of fun, actually. Uh, but I've been calling it, for lack of a better word, and I think Ken Wilson is right, the agency of God. And his argument was that you've got unequal things. That is to say, somewhere this leg over here is going to have something to do with the active engagement in physical and temporal affairs of the spirit. That does not mean the spirit wasn't always here. What it means is that our recognition, our active engagement of, of a Pentecostal charismatic kind of experience, our active engagement of the presence of the spirit as being co-player with us within time, whatever that is, whether it's the agency of God, and I, I, I agree that, that probably I've got a piece of the Trinity down here with the rest of us. I'm not at all sure that that's not really what's kind of happening, uh, just to tell you the truth. But I have to, in putting it up there, uh, say to you, please understand that not everybody agrees and that we don't have the right word for what this other leg is going to be. Now, this would be uh, Hooker's, uh, well, it would be Hooker's stool if I could draw. Um, this would be the three-legged stool. One of the great amazements to me, and it was a vineyard pastor who very recently showed it to me, was the thing that's wrong with Hooker's stool is not the names of the, of the legs on it. It's the fact that it never had a seat. It never had a seat. Yeah, and I never saw it. And then my vineyard pastor proceeded to say, said she, it was a lady, I have to say, what we really have now is the seat of authority. And she says with a wink in her eye, that seat of authority is Jesus, only probably to please everybody, we need to say that seat of authority is Jesus solus. Jesus only. And that it is Jesus only, it is Jesus solus, that keeps the legs apart, but also brings them together. That the tension that keeps them together and the tension that keeps them from collapsing into each other is the fact that there's a seat there. Now, I think there may be some rungs in here that Hooker didn't have either. But that's, that's an emergence approach. Now, yes, it's a metaphor. Yes, it's an image. I'm aware of that. And any time you do that, you, you simplify complicated things. Nonetheless, I think it's a very valuable one. I think it's a very valuable one. Uh, and a good one for us to begin to think about. Now, having done all that, we're going to go to Q&A. We're going to go to uh, uh, some... Uh, uh, conversation amongst ourselves, um, and we're going to go to some book signing, we're going to go to some prayer, uh, and we're going to do it all choppy chop, fast, fast. Uh, but what I want, we are now to just a little after three. Um, is that right? No, I mean a little after two. Oh, Lord, help us. Uh, we, uh, we have been here for an hour and 15 or 20 minutes. It is time for us, uh, would be time for us to take a biological break anyway. Uh, and we're going to take more than a biological break. Uh, please, uh, we've got uh, 15 minutes. Um, obviously, uh, restrooms are, are part of that. I would hope, and it's regrettable that there's not food over here because that would make it more. Self-organizing communities are a big part of what we're talking about. I'm asking that, if you can, each of you would go out and just begin to talk. Don't feel obliged to talk to somebody if he or she is a colossal bore or is not on the same wavelength with where you are. And don't hang with the people you came with, even the vestries who are on vestry retreat, if you can help it. Now, if it happens that you just love each other so much you can't be apart for 15 minutes, so be it. Um, but you're an odd vestry. I wish I were your, press, your priest, but that's okay. Um, 
So the point is to begin to talk to people across denominational lines, if you wish, or across familiarity lines, just to, until you find somebody who seems to you to be saying something that's meaningful to you or something that you would like to explore. I would hope that ultimately there would be little clumps of five or six of you who begin to, to move into a conversational group. When you come back, I'm going to ask you if you will sit with your new group and not where you are right now. You can leave your stuff and collect it later or take it with you. I hope you'll leave it because it's going to clutter you otherwise. But if you can begin to just sit with the folk with whom you spent this 15 minutes, or at least the 10 minutes of the 15. Uh, you don't want to take them everywhere you go. But uh, if you can, and let's see if we can begin to have conversation group to group and really try in the last, in the, in the last hour left to us to put some, where the rubber hits the road, to put some real um, weight on this thing, some practical implications. We will also undoubtedly uh, raise questions, things that didn't get covered or that you think are wrong. Uh, and please understand, um, you do something like this, there's a lot, a lot of error promulgated in this. I know that as well. Sometimes I'm just bone wrong. Sometimes, you know, uh, my sources are wrong or whatever, or it doesn't jive with your experience. Nothing is holy here. I long since gave that up. Uh, so all things are up for grabs. If we can do it, will, uh, will it be all right to reconvene at 2.30? Is, is that okay? That's 11 minutes. Oh, well, that won't work. Uh, all right, uh, 2.40? Okay. 2.40, and that'll, okay? Well, we don't have to do it this way. If I'm, I, I jerry-rigged this last night uh, uh, reading the cards. It was the cards that gave me the idea that you perhaps wanted to talk to each other m more than up here. And, and uh, 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 Oh, all right, you want to just take a potty break and come back for questions? Oh, this is purely uh, your call. All right, leave your stuff. Uh, <laughs> go do whatever. I, don't like I wrote it down.